and Ahmed from Georgia Tech is going to present on uh, Sabo, a client-based technique for mitigating the buffer bloat effects of adaptive video flows. He also told me, and I don't know, you know, let's see how his advisor reacts, he's, he told me he's going to finish pretty soon, so he'll be on the job <laughs> market. So if you're looking for a good student, talk to him afterwards. Please, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the introduction. So hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ahmad Mansi. I'm from Georgia Tech. Um, today I'm going to present Saber, a client-based technique for mitigating the buffer bloat effect of adaptive video flows. This work was done with my PhD advisor, Professor Mustafa Amar from Georgia Tech and with Bill Versteek from Cisco. So uh, it's a big title and we have the buffer bloat here. We heard about it in the panel in, in the morning. So let me first start by introducing what is uh, buffer bloat. So buffer bloat is a phenomenon where we experience a significantly high queuing delay resulting from the uh, interaction between TCP and large buffers on the internet. So basically, I'll briefly introduce how this works. You have a client and a server. You have a link between them, a bottleneck link of capacity C bits per second. The round trip delay is RTT. The way TCP works is that it tries, the sender tries to fill up the pipe between the, client and the, between the sender and the client by actually increasing, linearly increasing the sender window, the C win. And this is basically the number of bytes that the sender can send to the client before having to wait for an ACK from the client. So ideally, this C win should grow up to the bandwidth delay product, which is the multiplication of the C, the capacity of the bottleneck link, and the RTT. But since the sender doesn't know this value, it tries to, estimates this, uh, to estimate this value. So basically, it keeps increasing the C win, sending packets, until it detects some congestion, which is identified by some loss event. The packet gets lost. And the problem is, if you have large buffers on the internet, loss ha happens only after the buffers get full. So th the, the buffer gets full, then you start losing packets. So if you have large buffers, these loss events get delayed, actually. And you have increasing queuing delay. If you increase the queuing delay, then the sender will overestimate RTT, and of course, overestimate the bandwidth delay product, send even more data, and increase the queuing delay even more. So the takeaway here is that large buffers buffers will increase the queuing delay and also delay the loss events. So this is simply the buffer bloat problem. And also, I'll briefly introduce what Dash is. Of course, we have seen this slide many times, but let me just for the sake of the presentation. Uh, so Dash, we have a video split into a video segments, each a couple of seconds, few seconds. Uh, every video segment is encoded into multiple bit rates. And you have a manifest file, basically an XML file, describing all the video segments and all the bit rates. And these are hosted at a HTTP server. The Dash client first downloads the manifest file to learn about all the segments and the bit rates, starts downloading uh, these video segments. A typical Dash player has a playout buffer. So initially, the Dash player will download video segments as fast as possible until it fills out the playout buffer. After that, it moves to some uh, phase where it actually periodically downloads a new video segment every few seconds. So basically, the first phase is called the initial buffering phase. Second one is called the steady state or the on-off phase. Basically, it's called on-off because you download the segment, then you wait for a while, then you download the segment, this is on, and you wait, this is off. So in this work, we look at a very specific problem. Um, in a typical residential setting where you sit at home, you have a residential gateway connected to the internet, and you have multiple people at home doing different things. Some, someone is watching a Dash video, and someone is doing something else that is time sensitive. You can assume it's a VoIP call, something like Skype, uh, an over-the-top VoIP call. You can assume it's uh, maybe an online video game, something that is delay sensitive. And then we ask these questions. Does Dash cause buffer bloat? And Will the quality of this time-sensitive application like VoIP get affected by the dash flows? And if yes, how can we solve this? So in order to answer these questions, we first set up a test bed in the lab. And we do some experiments to actually measure the buffer bloat effect of dash flows. And then we actually found out that it is significant. And then we developed Sabre. It uh, stands for Smooth Adaptive Bitrate 
scheme to develop to mitigate this problem, and then we use the same test bed to evaluate our solution later. So let me first introduce the test bed we used and how we measured the dash, the buffer bloat effect of dash. So we have three machines here. The test bed is simply three boxes. The first one from the left is a Linux box acting as it has a standard Apache HTTP server and it hosts a dash data set from iTech, from Christian's group. And uh, the one in the middle, it's another Linux box. Uh, it's emulating the, it represents the residential gateway and we use this box to emulate 100 millisecond our own trip time to the video server. <coughs> And we use it also to emulate a 6 megabits per second link to the client. And it has a teardrop uh, buffer of 250 seconds, it's a 6 packets. And then the third one to the right here is just a laptop running a Dash client. And we actually used the VLC Dash player from iTech again. And then in order to um, emulate this kind of uh, VoIP traffic, we use iPerf to send UDP traffic from the video server to the client. And we use um, uh, 80 kilobits per second flow and packet size of 150 bytes each. And this is standard Skype traffic. Probably just got it from the Skype literature. And <coughs> when we do that, we start a streaming session, basically. We start a video at the client. Then we start iPerf. And we measure two things. The first thing we measure is the data rate on this link, the data rate coming from the video server to the gateway. And this is what we get. The x-axis is the time of the experiment. Y-axis is data rate in megabits per second. What we see that occasionally we get these huge bursts of data. It gets up to 250 megabits per second sometimes. And this is repeatable, actually. We always get that. Not all the time, but occasionally it happens. And the second thing we measure here is the queuing delay experienced by the UDP traffic at the gateway. And this is what we get. X-axis is time again, Y-axis is the queuing delay in milliseconds. And you can see it's very clear whenever you get these large bursts of data, you get high queuing delays that gets to maybe 500 milliseconds. And we know from the telephony industry that <coughs> Uh, a telephone call can have maybe up to 150 or 200 milliseconds is fine. Over that, it's not acceptable. So basically, and of course, you see here that the data coming from this side is 80 kilobits per second and the video traffic. So all this bursts of data and all this queuing delay is coming from the video, not from, of course, not from the UDP traffic. So basically, the conclusion here, that, yes, we proved that Dash has um, a significant buffer bloat effect, and it can affect VoIP. Of, or any time-sensitive application for that matter. So in order to understand better why we have this problem, we capture, we use Wireshark to capture the traffic uh, on the link between the, between the client and the server and to actually get the values of the receiver window and the congestion window of the TCP flow. And this is what we get. X-axis is time again, Y-axis is the window size in bytes. The red line is the value of the receiver window. You can see that it's at 600 kilobytes. It gets to that high value and just stays there most of the time. And this, the blue line, is, represents the condition window. It's not actually the exact value of the condition window. It's an estimate of the condition window. It's exactly the number of bytes in transit. This is what we get from catching the, the traffic. And what you see is that occasionally you get these high values for congestion window, which result in these bursts and result in this high queuing delay. So basically, TCP is bur bursty, and we know that already. Just wanted to confirm it for dash flows. So how can we solve that? Uh, there are many solutions possible for this problem. The first one is that you can consider some middle box techniques. You can deploy um, active queue management uh, in, in the middle boxes, like in your residential gateway, like Red, Blue, Codel, uh, Red. Of course, we know that it exists almost on every router on the internet, but very few people actually turn it on because it's hard to tune. Um, and we actually have some results in the paper about RED, and we show that it doesn't really solve the problem. Of course, we didn't really spend much effort trying to optimize the parameters. We just used some standard setting for RED, and it didn't really solve the problem. And then you can so use some server techniques by using some rate limiting techniques at the server to actually reduce the burst size. 
uh, coming from the server, which reduced the, the queuing delay. The, the point is, this is a very uh, viable solution, actually, but the point is, in order to have a universal effect, you have to convince all the server, video server uh, operators to actually implement such a technique. Uh, so we chose to go with a client-based solution that is smooth download driven by the client because we believe that there are only a handful of famous video players, the clients, if you actually manage to modify one, one or two, they'll have a universal effect immediately because everyone just updates the, their new software. So before going to the details of our solution, let me just present some hidden details that will be very important to our solution. So in the client, you have the application, the video player, and every video player has a playout buffer. And in the underlying uh, layer you have in the, in the operating system, you have a socket buffer. When the, sender, when the client sends an HTTP GET to fetch the new video segment, the video segment gets back to the socket buffer at the client. And then the client, the application, reads it from the socket buffer to the playout buffer using the receive call. And this is what happens. So you have two things to observe here. The first thing that there are two data channels. The first one is between the socket buffer and the playout buffer. And the second data channel is between the server and the client, the actual data channel on the internet. So the second thing to observe is that in a typical Dash player, these two data channels are coupled, meaning that the data rate that you observe here at the client in channel one is the same as the one that, that the actual data rate between the client and the server. And the reason is that because of this while loop, always read, I mean, the application always reads data from the socket buffer as fast as possible. Whenever you get data, just always read the data. So just keep in mind here that if you play, play a little bit with this loop, if you control the rate of the receive call, you can actually decouple these two channels. And when you decouple the channels, basically what you observe here as a data rate coming to the playout buffer is not necessarily the same data rate on the internet, the actual data rate in the channel between the, the server and the client. And this will be very import important to our solution. Just remember this part. So going back to the details of our technique, basically we know that from TCP, we know that TCP can send a burst of the minimum of R wind and C wind and the receiver window and the congestion window. We know that congestion window is basically controlled by the server. We don't really have any control on that. So what we can do is if we want to minimize the burst size, we can reduce the value of R wind. So basically to control this minimum to reduce it. So we reduce the burst value. So but what is R wind? How does it work? So R wind is basically a function of the empty space on the socket buffer. The exact function depends on the implementation of the TCP stack, but it's, we know that R wind is proportional to the empty space on the socket buffer. Basically, when the socket buffer is empty, R wind gets its maximum value. When the socket buffer is full of data, R wind gets to a minimum value. So basically, if you want to minimize R wind, we can just keep the socket buffer full of data all the time. And this will actually minimize R wind, almost full of data. And remember here that the receive call is the one that is draining data from the socket buffer. So basically, we read data from the socket buffer using the receive call. So if you want to keep the socket buffer full, just reduce the receive call. Just keep it as a minimum, at a minimum. But the problem is the receive call is the call that is actually filling the playout buffer. So if you reduce it to some below some value, it can starve the playout buffer. So you have to find a value that is actually finding a balance. To, uh, uh, to achieve two objectives. The first one is to keep the socket buffer almost full all the time and to actually not to starve the playout buffer. How can we do that? So basically, this is the traditional uh, dash player. You just have an on, an off. You send an HTTP GET, you get the segment, you wait for a while, you send another one, you get the segment, and so on. The problem here is that during this off period, the, the socket buffer is, is empty of data. There's no data in the same, uh, socket buffer. So basically, when you send the next get, the, the R wind is at its maximum value. And this is why you get these large bursts. So how can we, maybe we should just get rid of these off periods so we don't have this problem. So how can we get rid of this, uh, the off period? We can do that. We can actually control the receive rate, the, rec the rate of the receive call, to actually receive a segment without any off periods. Basically, if you have a video segment, a video bit rate at four megabits per second, 
just receive it at four megabits per second. And then you get rid of these off periods. But there is a problem here uh, that a da typical Dash player uses the value of the download rate to estimate the available bandwidth on the channel between the client and the server. So if we, if we actually enforce the client to receive data at four megabits per second, it's like you're enforcing the client to estimate the available bandwidth to be four megabits per second. So how can, how can we overcome this problem? We actually not, do not do this, we do that. So the dotted line here is the bitrate of the best video profile. So let's say you have the best video profile is four megabits per second. So we actually control the receive rate to achieve a download rate of maybe 4.5 megabits per second. Because there is no point for the client to download at a much higher bitrate because the best case is to reach to the best video profile. And the reason we move between these high and low download rates is that we don't want to overfill the playout buffer. So we use this high value until the playout buffer is 100%, we then we move to the low value and then so on. So when we do that, this is what we get. We send the get, goes to the server, the server will reply with the segment, segment will sit at the socket buffer and then the client, the application layer will consume the data. So observe here that this part is thicker than this part. And the reason is that we control the receive rate, so basically the, this is the application consuming data. It takes more time for the application to consume data than for the server to deliver the data to the socket buffer actually. Then what happens? And then we don't have to have these off periods. Immediately the client will send the next get and gets the next uh, video segment. But still we didn't solve the problem because at this point, the client, the application has already consumed all the data from the socket buffer. So basically the socket buffer is empty again, right? So if the socket buffer is empty, R1 gets its maximum value, we still get these bursts. We didn't really solve the problem. We just got rid of these off periods, but we didn't solve the problem. How can we solve, how can we keep the socket buffer full at this point? It's, it's empty of data. So the way we solve this problem is actually by using HTTP pipelining. And for those of, most of you of course know what is pipelining, but for those of you who don't know, you just send back-to-back -back HTTP requests without having to wait for the reply from the server. We compute the number of segments that you, know, you need to pipeline by this formula, one plus the size of the socket buffer in bytes divided by the segment size, the average segment size in bytes. Basically this uh, formula computes the number of segments to fill out the socket buffer. So for just simplicity, assume this formula gives you two. So you send two back to back, get segment one and segment two. Then the server will reply with segment one and then while the, the client is consuming segment one from the buffer, segment two will be in the way. So at this point, when the client has already uh, consumed all segment one from the socket buffer, segment two is sitting in the socket buffer, so it's not empty anymore. So the next time when you're sending get segment three, the socket buffer is full, so R wind will be a minimum value, you won't get these large bursts. So what happens here is that segment three will be coming from the server and at the same time the, the application will be consuming segment two from the socket buffer and this is what happens. And you always keep in this loop so you never get an empty socket buffer, you never get these large values for R wind and we solve the problem, but not completely. We still have one small issue here. So uh, uh, you can simply look at the socket buffer as that it's, it's a queue, it's a buffer, and the input rate is the available bandwidth on the link between the server and the client, and the consumption rate is, on average, the video bit rate. So as long as the available bit rate is higher than the video bit rate, you're good. But the problem is when the available bandwidth drops below the video bit rate, you can't really sustain to have the socket buffers full. I mean, you're consuming data at a higher rate than the filling date rate. So how, how do we solve this? I mean, the problem is, if this happens, then socket buffer gets empty and you get these large R wind and bursts and so on. So the way we solve this problem is by actually continuously monitoring the data level in, on the socket buffer. We have an API, you can look at the paper, um, and we continuously, continuously monitor the data level here 
And whenever it drops below a certain threshold, we just react very quickly. So let me show you some results. Uh, we used the same test bed I described uh, earlier, and we implemented Saber in the VLC dash player. And this is uh, first experiment. We on the left we have the queuing delay. I mean, x-axis is time of the experiment, y-axis is queuing delay for the traditional on-off is the traditional player without our technique. You see here the delays can go to 400 milli, uh, milliseconds, 600 milliseconds, jumps even to like 700, 800 milliseconds. And this this is Saber, our our technique. It's mostly below 50 milliseconds, even low, lower most of the time. And the takeaway here uh, is that for on-off delay is greater than 200 milliseconds for about 40% of the time, and it's less than 50 milliseconds uh, about 100% of the time for our case. So, but we haven't talked about variable bandwidth. How do we react when the available bandwidth between the client and the server change? So basically, this is the case. This is time, and this is the available bandwidth over time. You have some high value, then at some point in time, it drops to this low value, and then goes back to the, uh, the available bandwidth. So how do we react to that? So initially, it, let's assume that this, this is a video bit rate the client decided to use. During this period, the socket buffer is full, right? It's, it's a norm, normal operation, and the socket buffer is full. And basically, the playout, the, the application is downloading data from the socket buffer. The problem is when the socket buffer is full, we cannot really, now the two channels are decoupled, right? We cannot really estimate the available bandwidth when it drops here. The only clue that we get when the available bandwidth drops is that the socket buffer gets drained. and We cannot really sustain it to have it full all the time. Then the client okay, detects that the socket buffer has dropped, it waits for a while, and then it keeps dropping, so it decides to go to some lower bit rate and keeps there for a while. At this point in time, now the socket buffer is full again because we managed to, we reduce the video bit rate, we reduce the receive rate, now the socket buffer is full again. But the problem is once the socket buffer is full, we can't really estimate the available bandwidth. So we don't know when it's going to go up again, right? So we have to do that just by trying. Basically, we try to go to some higher bit rate and wait there for a while. So if the player can sustain this bit rate and the socket buffer doesn't get drained, we continue. But in this case, the, the available bandwidth is still below the video bit rate. So we can't really sustain this video bit rate. We go back to the lower bit rate. This may uh, repeat for uh, many times. It depends on how long you'll have this low uh, available bandwidth. But at some point in time, you'll be able to sustain the higher video bit rate and then try the higher one and so on until you get to the best video bit rate. And this is how adaptation works. Um, to show you some results, we did experiments on the same um, test bed. The available bandwidth starts with 6 megabits per second, drops to 3, and then goes back to 6. And this is what we get. This is a queuing delay in the on-off, the traditional on-off uh, video player. And uh, this is a queuing delay on the y-axis. You see that once you drop the available bandwidth to 3 megabits per second, delay jumps to over 1 second, even reaches to 1.5 seconds. Here in our case, just observe that this is 1,500 milliseconds and this is 400 milliseconds. So here it's always below 150, maybe, milliseconds. And most of the time it's below 100 milliseconds. And actually, if you look at these points when we get these uh, l relatively large <laughs> A queuing delay, it happens because we try to upshift, it doesn't work, we go back again. We try to upshift, it doesn't work, then we go back again. And this is why we get these relatively large, uh, like below 100 millisecond delay. So we also did some exp experiments using multiple clients. Uh, so basically you have two clients sharing the same residential gateway to the server. Uh, we have uh, experiments using two on-off clients, two saber clients, and one on-off, one saber. For the two on-off clients, basically you have the delay goes up to 800 and 1,000 millisecond, and here in the two saber clients, it's below 200 and 100 milliseconds. 
And actually, in the case with, where you have one on off and one saber, it's closer to this case, actually. It's very similar to this case. So basically, just to summarize the talk, uh, we sh have shown that on-off behavior or adaptive video flows can have a significant buffer bloat effect. We designed and implemented the technique to mitigate this problem, uh, a client-based technique to mitigate the problem. And then the conclusion is that a single on-off client, a single traditional dash player can actually cause significantly uh, high queuing delays. So basically, in order to have a perfect world, all the clients should use our technique to have uh, low queuing delay. As a future work, we uh, should work on the adaptation logic in the case of the mix of Sabre and on-off to actually try to mitigate this problem by maybe investigating some dash-aware middle box and server techniques to solve the buffer block problem. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. There's a question all the way in the back. Uh, well, first, uh, did you observe that uh, actually uh, YouTube uh, in smartphones actually for high bitrate video uh, exhibit this kind of traffic pattern? We haven't done any, you're saying YouTube for mobile? Yes. Yeah, we haven't really tried to do that. But I think YouTube is using adaptive uh, streaming only in the, the latest version after like YouTube after the operating system iOS 6.0. This is when I started to see that YouTube is using adaptive. Before that, we didn't. I, I didn't think to use adaptive video. Uh, it's not for adaptive. It's for progressive download. When uh, the player uh, tries to download high bitrate video, mm -hmm. so uh, it actually exhibits this constant uh, uh, bitrate video. I mean, it always receives uh, at the encoding rate almost equal to the encoding rate. So uh, this actually exhibits this similar kind of traffic pattern, I mean. Well, I mean, I, mean, I haven't done any experiments using YouTube, but um, YouTube is not really, uh, I mean, it's not yeah, segmented. The not video is not segmented. It's progressive download. Yeah. So I'm not sure if it will have the same properties. But the problem is even if you only do that, even if you only control the download rate from the client to be... Uh, without limiting the burst size. I mean, the download rate is one thing and the burst size is, is another thing. So uh, yeah. So I, I actually have seen some, a paper from YouTube group that they were trying to limit the uh, burst size because it actually works for the network, for the CDN, and it reduces the loss rate globally on the CDN of YouTube. Okay. Uh, another question is that, uh, uh, well, when you are changing the bit, uh, bit rate or when you are stable, for example, in a particular uh, rate, so why you just do not uh, limit the chunk size to only one second? Limit the chunk size. So you will get uh, after every one second the chunk. So it will uh, reduce the, the queuing effect at the router. As no, well. The problem is if the video segment is two seconds and you download a new video segment every one second, then your playout buffer will just grow infinitely. It, you have to, if, if the video segment is two seconds, you have to download a new video segment every two seconds to keep a steady playout buffer. Otherwise, it will just go infinitely. That's a dash characteristic. Yeah, that's a dash characteristic, exactly. Okay, thanks. Sure. Coming up. So did you consider a random early drop or you know, things like that. Yeah, we have some results in the paper about RED, but we didn't really spend much effort trying to uh, optimize RED. We just used some standard uh, deployment parameters. And did I mean, it reduced the problem a little bit. Let me show you here. I mean, drop tail is the worst thing you can do of course. for this kind of traffic. But, so. but this is what everyone uses at home, right? So we used RED, and we didn't really, I mean, we didn't use it extensively, but well, it reduces the queuing delay here to maybe 250, 300 sometimes. And this is with a constant bitrate, the constant available bandwidth. When, when we change it, even it gets worse, actually. Red doesn't really help solving much. Maybe if you have some adaptive red, some self-optimizing red, maybe it will work. But we didn't really try that. Okay. We have one more question. 
So if I understood correctly, this problem happens because uh, the, 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 the socket buffer is drained because uh, there's not enough download, basically, because you've reached. It, it, it only happens when you ha you're, you've reached the highest quality. No. So basically, socket buffer gets drained because the way it works, the way that the uh, client, the play video player works, that downloads a video segment. And then what, once it's already downloaded the video segment, it downloads a new video segment after some time. So the point is, at the point uh, when you're the done downloading the video segment, yeah, but the, the after, socket buffer is empty. The after, after sometimes, it's it's the strategy of the of the dash player to yes. to, to wait or not. Yes. So maybe for live cases it will have to wait because there's nothing else to download. Mm -hmm. But for VOD cases, you have to wait as well. No, you can if, if if everything is available from the beginning, you can start download as much as possible uh, segments in advance. But you cannot download infinitely because you have a I mean a limit on the playout buffer. You have a playout buffer. You cannot really download beyond that. You have a 30 seconds, 60 seconds playout buffer. You cannot really download any more, right? So you'll download whatever number of segments until you fill out the buffer, then you'll have to wait. And this is what I had in the first slide, that there is an initial buffering phase where you download as fast as possible, as you were saying. Then once you reach to filling out the playout buffer, you can't really download anymore. You have to download every like two seconds, only one segment to keep a steady playout buffer. Otherwise, it will just grow infinitely. And this is how Dash works. Right. OK. Okay, I think with respect to time, let's move on. Um, thank you very much again.